autoimmune mm-hmm. disease. I have a whole different take on autoimmune disease than probably most every rheumatologist in the really? world. So here's my take. 80% of autoimmune disease is seen in women. That's a fact. Mm. There are 88 different diagnoses of autoimmune diseases that have different names, re- different reimbursement codes. Like MS or lupus or Hashimoto. Type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes. Is yep. A ton of them, right? If we then take those 80-some diagnoses that all associate themselves with autoimmune disease, then we ask the question, and 80% of those are found in females, then we ask the question, does that mean that females have a weak immune system? That they're, they're born with an imperfect immune system? Or, here's my model, they're not born with an imperfect immune they're, they're born with a perfect immune system to adapt to that which is the biggest stress on their immune system that a woman will ever have. It's called childbearing. Mm. Now think of what happens if you have a child in the womb that doesn't have your genes, or right. has part of your genes. Yeah. It may be even a different gender. And now your body has to accommodate that. If you put that in a male's body, you're going to have problems. Yeah. That person's going to have a, probably a, acute immune catastrophe. But in a woman, that immune system has to accommodate that and nurture it and uh, successfully well, that's deliver it. question, just to jump on a sidetrack here for a minute. Is it true that women who haven't had babies or been pregnant don't have as much immune disease? Yes, there is a correlation between childbearing and autoimmune disease, right? That's a, that's a whole other interesting topic. Rather than tell that woman you have an imperfect immune system, we might say you have a very adept immune system for finding out that something in the environment is not right. Mm. Maybe you're the yellow canary because eventually maybe that signal that you're picking up will be seen in everybody if it becomes severe enough or high enough level of exposure. Mm -hmm. Now what used to be just in a few now becomes in many. It's just that you are genetically more responsive. So you have a super good immune system, (laughs) it turns out. So rather than calling you damaged merchandise or wrong, what we need to do is take the uniqueness of your immune system and find out how to detune it in response to that particular thing that's alarming it because your alarm mechanism is going off. And our job on on the practitioner side is to help interrogate what we're going to do to produce an environment that your immune system will find favorable. This whole puzzle of chronic disease, why we're seeing this epidemic. Some people say, oh, well, we, we didn't have it before because we didn't live that long. And everybody died at 40. Baloney. And that's really not true. A lot of people live to be very old. Baloney. In many, many cultures. I mean, yeah, if you were born. What about children with uh, NASH? How yeah. about kid, t- teenagers that have fatty liver disease? We never, when I was in school in the 60s, there was no such thing as fatty no, liver disease no. in children. Not when I was in school in the eighties. Uh, yeah, there, there is. This is ridiculous fallacy. But to the say, idea that you know that we we these chronic diseases are only occurring because we're getting older and they're they're sort of normal part of human development and aging that they're kind of inevitable. It's sort of a something I've heard people say, but I, I think there's a real flaw in that because when you look at the historical records, like for example, the Native Americans in the plains, they had this highest number of centenarians of any population at the turn of the last century, and they were living on bison. And yes, you had a lot of maybe death in childbirth, infant mortality, that would affect life expectancy. But we we had, and we had have extended life expectancy because of sanitation and hygiene and a lot of reasons, better medical care in some cases. But these chronic illnesses of aging, which we've come to expect as normal, you know, heart disease, cancer, diabetes, dementia, and even things that, you know, we don't think of as disease of aging, like mental health issues, depression, anxiety, bipolar, schizophrenia, ADD, autism, Parkinson's. I mean, these are these are things that we now are understanding are connected to inflammation. I remember back in 1997 when this paper came out in the New England Journal by Paul Ricker, which yeah. essentially yeah. was a Harvard professor mm-hmm. that showed that people with high levels of inflammation had a high risk of heart attacks. And there was Follow on studies where they showed that if your cholesterol was high, but your inflammation was low, you had a low risk. But if your inflammation was high and your cholesterol was low, you had a high risk. So, yeah. so basically it was the inflammation that was the problem, not the cholesterol. And, and pathologists were, would see in the plaques in arteries back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, they would see macrophages and they'd see, you know, uh, T cells in, but you're part of the immune system in the plaque and they just didn't know what to make of it. And they thought it was just a plumbing problem. And and fat build up in your arteries from eating fat. And that was an overly simplistic model. And now what's happened since that seminal paper from Paul Ricker at Harvard linking inflammation and heart disease, inflammation is now connected to all the chronic diseases of aging and aging itself. And so when we look around us, it seems like the final common link between all these chronic illnesses that we're suffering from in today's society are related to inflammation and that some dysregulation of the immune system. 
you use the word macrophage. So the macrophage is an immune cell that's a member of the first line of defense, the innate immune system. So the macrophage has this ability to go in and out of cells. It travels in your bloodstream and then it can come up to a plate on your blood vessel wall. And it, by a message, it can say, hey, I should go inside and, and interrogate what's going on inside the blood vessel wall. And there, there are several layers of the blood vessel wall. So it goes through the first layer, which is the in, endothelial level. And it gets into the intimal level. And then eventually it sees if there's something funny going on in there. And if it sees something funny going on, it, it does what it's supposed to do. is to get rid of funny business and attack it as a foreigner. So it does a macrophage engulfment, and it goes through its process, which is killing by chemical warfare through the release of oxidants. So what could be inside that vessel wall that would precipitate that? It could be many different things, one of which could be oxidized LDL. It could There could be subparticles of cholesterol that are been modified. Rancid fat, That's exactly which right. Which is kind of foreign. It's not a normal lipid. Precisely. And so now or it's doing- Or microplastics, <laughs> which are now found in- Artery walls. Yeah, so it's doing what it's supposed to do. It's it's search, seek and destroy foreigners. The problem is we need to not just stop the macrophage from working. Let's just block its function by giving an anti-macrophage drug. Let's find why it would find a foreigner there and treat that so it doesn't have to be in an alarm state. You, you just unpacked why we have so much chronic disease. It's our crappy diet, which is full of processed foods, limited amounts of variety of foods, lack of protective nutrients, lack of nutrients and vitamins, minerals, an overload of environmental toxins and chemicals from petrochemical toxins, from uh, heavy metal toxins, from all the things we're exposed to, the stress we have, the sleep disruption, this lack of sort of regulation of our circadian rhythm, the lack of connection socially, and so many things that are impacting us. The overuse of certain drugs like antibiotics, the increase in C-section rights, the increase in uh, bottle feeding and lack of breastfeeding. I mean, all these are compounding over uh, generations to have the worst epidemic of chronic disease in human history. And we are the epicenter in the United States. All these issues and all the things we talked about at the end of the day come down to a problem with the immune system. And this is what we're, this is really what the, the sort of amazing discovery is that, that uh, we're going to unpack today, which is how does your immune system connect to these diseases? We, we now sort of understand why it's dysregulated, which means we can do something about it. And we're going to get very specific about how modifying certain things like diet or certain plant chemicals or phytochemicals, for example, like from a Himalayan tartary buckwheat, an ancient food that was you know used for thousands of years actually has chemicals in it, phytochemicals that regulate the immune system. And we now know this on a granular level. So we're seeing this sort of one, on one hand, this rising understanding of chronic disease being an inflammatory state, aging itself being an inflammatory state if we, if we don't properly understand how to regulate that. And at the same time, we're, we're seeing this rise in our ability to have really granular understanding diagnostically of what's happening at the gene level, at the epigene level, at the immune cell level, in ways that we never did before that are kind of uncovering relationships and connections and things that help us to understand how to modify our lifestyle and our diet and our habits so that we can properly regulate our immune system so it does the right thing, which is to fight foreign invaders when we need that to, but not to do the wrong thing, which is to be overactive in a state of, of chronic disease or an autoimmune disease or an allergy, right? We don't want that. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here.